Hello everyone, I'm Demi Vaughn for the Power of the Patient Project. My guest today is Neil Bernard. Dr. Bernard is the president of the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, founder of the Bernard Medical Center, and adjunct professor of medicine at the George Washington University School of Medicine, and a fellow of the American College of Cardiology. His federally funded diabetes research revolutionized the nutritional approaches to type 2 diabetes, and he now aims to empower readers with life-changing information on hormones and health. He has written more than 19 books on nutrition and health. Welcome, Dr. Bernard. Thank you. Great to be with you today. So could you please explain the concept of a plant-based diet and the advantages it provides? Sure. A uh, plant-based diet is basically the opposite of everything that I ate growing up. Um, I grew up in North Dakota, and it's kind of cattle country. And I ate really very much the way most Americans eat, which was our diet was a meat-based diet. But when you go to a plant-based diet, what are you doing? You're throwing out the meat and the dairy products and eggs. And that is easier than you think, but it's also dramatically more powerful than you think. Uh, when a person switches from meat chili to bean chili, suddenly there's no cholesterol in your diet anymore. There's no animal fat in your diet anymore. Um, the hormones that are in animals are gone and your health can revolutionize. You know, we used to think of this as a rather modest thing. It's huge. We've seen people who have had diabetes. It improves and sometimes goes away. Uh, heart disease can improve and sometimes even just reverse where the arteries open up again. The risk of cancer goes way, way down, but the perhaps unexpected surprise is that although it sounds like a challenge, I'm gonna do plant-based diet, after a couple of weeks you discover, I'm eating better than I ever ate before because the foods are more varied, more delicious, more exciting. So that, that's, uh, don't take this on faith, you're gonna discover this yourself, but it's, um, it's a, a really great change. Yeah, I, um, it's funny because I actually, like last summer, I did a pledge with this vegan group to go vegan for a couple of months. And I went through with it, like I don't eat meat right now. But one thing that's really hard for me to drop is cheese. I have such a hard time like with cheese because I love cheese and I just feel like cheese gives your food like that extra layer. But I just find it really hard to like break away from cheese. <laughs> You are not alone. <laughs> uh, we have worked with thousands and thousands of people, both in our medical center and also in research studies. And the one food that everybody has trouble with is cheese. And by the way, it's not milk. It's not ice cream. It's not yogurt. It's not other dairy products. It's specifically cheese. And you think, why do people get hooked on cheese? You know, it, it smells like old socks. Why do people get hooked on it? And there is a reason. The, the reason is there are drugs in cheese that addict you. And now that sounds like a strong statement, doesn't it? But if you could look at the, the dairy protein, it's, it's called casein, C-A-S-E-I-N, casein. It's in milk and it ends up in all other dairy products. If you could look at it under a powerful microscope, you would discover that along this protein molecule, this casein molecule, there are little opiates built into the molecule that when you digest the protein, they come out, they go to the brain, they attach to the very same receptors that heroin or morphine would attach to. In other words, they are very mild opiates. Um, and people experience this in other ways. Um, if you ever had, um, let, let's say you went to the hospital for an operation or something like that, and after you go home, they'll give you some Demerol or some other powerful painkiller, which happens to have narcotic uh, activity too. And one of the big side effects is it constipates you. And that's simply because all the narcotics just shut down your digestive tract. Well, if a person ever lingered too long at the cheese platter, um, the big side effect is they get constipated too because now it's the narcotic in their digestive tract. Now, I know it sounds funny to think that there are addictive chemicals in cheese, but they're there for a reason. Um, the milk going from the mama cow to the calf has protein and sugar and hormones and fat and other things to, to make the baby grow. But it also has a little bit of feel good so that the baby bonds with mother. Um, and that's what those chemicals are there for. And um, 
when you take milk, it has a little bit of these chemicals in it. When you take the milk and convert it to cheese, it concentrates those chemicals. So every single person went vegan at some point thought, wow, cheese is different. It's not the same as other foods. I'm having a little withdrawal when I try to get away from it. But it's the best thing in the world to get away from because it is 70% fat. It is mostly saturated fat. It has hormones. I'm talking estrogens that came from the cow. They're going into your body. And if it were any worse, it would be Vaseline. So I'm hoping that all of our cheese addicted friends will find a way to break free from it. Um, and I might mention for people who are changing their diet for ethical reasons or for environmental reasons, oh my goodness sakes, there's a lot to be said about cheese there too. Yeah, definitely. Well, I appreciate all of that information. That's really helpful and really educational, honestly. I had no idea that cheese had all of those um, like hormones and just like addictive properties in it. So It's surprising to think, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, and there's more to it. I mean, the other thing is when they make cheese, they add a lot of salt at the, at the factory. You don't really taste it so much, but there is more salt in cheese than there is in potato chips, ounce per ounce. And we love kind of salty, greasy things like French fries and onion rings. And so cheese has all of this stuff. It's got the salt, it's got the grease, it's got the drug traces. And that's why there's just no other food that yeah. addicts, addicts people like cheese does. Right. <laughs> so, Am I cheering you up with this? Yeah, I mean, like, I'm, I'm learning a lot, so yeah. I okay. appreciate it. But, um, yeah, so my second question for you. So in your book, Your Body in Balance, you discuss how food can affect your hormones. Can you explain how this works exactly? Yeah. Um, in your body, you have hormones. That A hormone is just a, a natural chemical in your body made in one part of your body that goes somewhere else to do its work. Like your thyroid gland at the base of your neck is this little modest organ that makes thyroid hormone that goes in your bloodstream to your cells and it gives your, your body energy. Or your pancreas, which is behind your belly button, makes another hormone, insulin, that goes to the muscle cells and the liver cells. To, it, it acts like a key to get sugar into the cell to give it energy. But there are all kinds of hormones and they control everything in your body. And most people have no idea that their hormones are affected by the foods that they eat. Um, we mentioned one and that's estrogen. A woman's ovaries make estrogens. And so they get her body ready for pregnancy and they do all kinds of other things. Um, and it, let's say you eat cheese <laughs> or milk to just continue that discussion. You're getting estrogens that the cow made um, because cows are pregnant uh, every, they're impregnated every, it's a creepy thing, but every dairy farm they're impregnated annually. And um, they are milked into their pregnancy and pregnant cows make a lot of estrogen that get into the cheese. Um, but there's more to it. Your, your body's also trying to get rid of estrogens because if there's, too much of them, that aggravates menstrual pain. It will aggravate endometriosis and fibroid growth um, and causes all kinds of other issues. And so your liver will actually get rid of those extra estrogens by pulling them from the blood. And it, the liver can actually send the estrogens into your intestinal tract and they go out with your waste. However, if there's no fiber in the foods that you eat, fiber is the roughage in beans and vegetables and fruits. If there's no fiber, then the estrogens don't stay in the intestinal tract because there's no fiber to keep them there. And they get reabsorbed back into the blood. And so you end up with more estrogen than you should have in your bloodstream. And over time that contributes to, as I said, menstrual pain and endometriosis, and also to higher risk of hormone related cancers like breast cancer. So that's why doctors like me are saying, whatever our genetic risk and whatever else we're doing to improve our health, um, we want to get the animal products out of the diet. And not only does that get rid of the cheese and all the bad stuff, but it also means that every single thing you eat has fiber in it. So you're every, everything you're eating is a vegetable or a fruit or a grain or something, uh, and you're getting extra fiber and suddenly your, your body breathes a sigh of relief 
because it's finally able to get rid of those excess hormones it, it, it didn't want. So that's just the beginning. But there are many other ways that we can key in our hormones so that our estrogen behaves, our thyroid will behave, our insulin will behave. And maybe we can say, get rid of diabetes, for example. Right. So what exactly does a hormone balanced diet look like? Okay, um, big principles. Um, high fiber, really low fat. And so to convert that into foods, um, animal products are not so hot because even though I grew up with them as most people did, uh, chicken, fish, zero fiber. They're not from a plant, they don't have any fiber. They've also got a lot of fat in them. Surprisingly, even if you take the skin off your chicken, there's a surprising amount of fat in the chicken, the Chinook salmon, everything's got a lot of fat. Um, if I have vegetables, beans, whole grains, fruits, they all have fiber, because that's where nature put it. And they don't have a whole lot of fat, uh, with a few exceptions, nuts and avocados, a few other foods have fat, but the others have just kind of the right amount of fat for the human body. So let me turn that into a meal. Um, let's say we go to an Italian restaurant and they bring us our angel hair pasta. I can cover it with the Alfredo creamy goo sauce. No, 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 what, what else you got? I can have the Arrabbiata plant-based sauce which is spicy, but it's a tomato base, so that'll work. Um, or we go next door to the Mexican restaurant, and they've got bean burritos, and if they hold the cheese, that's vegan. Um, or they've got beans and rice, and, and veggie tacos, and fajitas, and things. Okay, that'll work. Then down the street from that is the Chinese place, and they've got rice dishes, and tofu dishes, and vegetable dishes, beautifully spiced. And what if we went sushi? Okay, uh, the sushi bar's got all kinds of stuff we're not going to eat, but they have the cucumber rolls, the asparagus rolls, the sweet potato rolls. Okay, let's say we go Ethiopian. There's a whole world of wonderful foods that are in themselves humble foods like split peas and lentils and potatoes, carefully made and beautifully spiced and served with all kinds of delicious, uh, delicate breads that make life really worth living. And what you discover is that every cuisine has as its base, plant-based staples. And then when different cultures got a little extra money and they discovered they could kill the pig, um, then we started to get into maybe less healthy ways of eating. But when we go back to our, to our more fundamental traditions, there is so much wonderful food to eat there. So that to me is what a plant-based diet looks like. Definitely, I definitely agree with you. And I definitely think that considering the fact that we live in America and just like fast food and beef and chicken is just, it's put in the media and then that's also like what we've been that's all that we've ate like as americans so i feel like when people like think of a plant-based diet they don't really feel like they're getting like the necessary nutrition or they feel like they're not getting full off of plants if you get what i'm saying yeah i, I know what you mean um people do eat a lot of chicken and so forth americans eat a million chickens per hour um, yeah, believe it or not, it's it, astronomical, especially around the time of the Super Bowl when it's wing after wing after wing, you know, and the waistlines you know, expand, <laughs> cancer rates go up, um, the emergency rooms all filled the next day. Um, but but we can we can change that. And and when people do switch to a plant based diet, they do discover that they tend to, at first the first couple of days, it's 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 like being in a new country. You're you're discovering new tastes and new stores and all new kinds of habits. You're also discovering that all your vegan friends have been wondering where you've been all this time. And they're kind of glad that you're finally getting with it. Um, but what you discover pretty soon is that you get full a little sooner. Um, by, by sooner, I mean with a smaller amount of calories. Um, you don't think so. You think, oh, I must be eating just as much as before. But because everything you're eating has fiber in it and fiber doesn't really have much calories, um, your average person typically starts losing weight really easily. Um, and, and that is assuming that you have any extra weight to lose. If you don't, you don't lose weight. But, but people who are have been trying to lose weight, um, they discover that they lose a little bit of weight because the fiber fills them up a couple hundred calories sooner than it would have otherwise. Yeah. Yeah, it's a cool thing. A lot of sense, yeah. So for someone with the type 2 diabetes, how can eating a plant-based diet help restore insulin function? 
oh, this is the most important thing. And I, let, let me explain the cause of type 2 diabetes because this is so, so, so important and people get this completely wrong. Uh, people imagine that diabetes comes from eating sugar or from eating bread or other starches that turn to sugar. And this is not exactly accurate. Um, diabetes starts in your cells and we can see from the disease process how to turn it around. And, and here's what it is. If you can look at your cells with a special scanning device, which we can do. It's, it, with us, it's called magnetic resonance spectroscopy, but you don't try this at home. But what we see inside the cells of a person who's got type 2 diabetes, their, their muscle cells are normally powered by sugar, glucose. It's, it's a healthy sugar that comes from the food you eat. It goes into the cell and it gives you energy. So a person who's going to run a marathon, if they've got healthy glucose in their blood and stored in their liver and stored in their muscles, they can run because glucose is like, it is like gasoline for your Ferrari. Um, glucose is the fuel for your muscles. Okay, so the issue is this, that glucose can't get inside your, your muscle cells, period. Cannot get in at all until you have insulin, the insulin hormone, which is like a key that opens up the cell membrane and in comes the sugar. So your pancreas makes the insulin, it gets to the, the, the cell, and if that cell was full of chicken fat or fish fat or beef fat or fryer grease or any other grease from the stuff that we've been eating, the cell resists it. It, it can't open up anymore. That's called insulin resistance. And that is the first step for diabetes. And you will see that not just in a, uh, a 39 year old person who's about to be diabetic at age 40. Um, you will see that in a 14 year old or a 16 year old who had diabetes in their family, they're not gonna get it for another 15 years, but the disease process is starting. It to be real simple about it, fats from the foods you eat, especially animal products, cheese, meat, all that stuff, it gets into the cells and it causes this insulin resistance. And then the glucose can't get into the cells, it builds up in the blood and the doctor says, your blood sugar is really high, you got diabetes. What do I do? Uh, I'm gonna give you metformin, and then the metformin isn't enough. Uh, let's talk about needles. I mean, you got to inject insulin. You say, well, I don't want to do that. And the doctor says, you're stuck. You know, you got no choice. Stop. You got a choice. And what I would encourage anybody to do, see your doctor, follow your doctor's advice, but get the animal products out of your diet 100%. And just do this for a couple of months as a test. Keep the vegetable oils really low too. You can't feel it. But the cells of your body, because there's no more animal fat coming in, they start getting rid of the fat they've got. It starts to dissipate. And your insulin will start to work again. And the sugar can now get into your cells. And as that happens, your blood sugar comes down and down and down and down and down. And your doctor is going to say, I don't know what you're doing, but keep doing it because I need to cut you down on your insulin. And eventually your doctor says, I don't know how you did this, but you don't need insulin anymore. And in fact, it's essential to work with your doctor because this diet is so powerful that for some people, if they're doing this powerful diet and all the powerful drugs they were using before, it's too much. And they get too low of a blood sugar and that could be risky. So a plant-based diet allows your insulin hormone to do its work by getting away from the insulin resistance. And I will never forget when we started doing studies on this we saw something we'd never seen before, which is diabetes going away. And can you imagine what it feels like to be a person where maybe your mother had this, or your grandfather, or your aunt, or your uncle, and you know it can threaten your, your vision. It can lead to dialysis, it can lead to amputations. And if you have conquered it, and you don't have it anymore, then not only is your health rejuvenated, but you've now got the best gift of all to give to your kids or your reluctant spouse or whoever might want to hear about this, which is th this gift of health that is, is just irreplaceable. Yeah, I will definitely be passing all of this information along to my grandmother. She's actually borderline diabetic and um, she really wants to work on eating a plant-based diet and cutting out all the, you know, unnecessary fats and sugars and animal products, but it's like really hard for her. <laughs> 
but I definitely will be passing this information to her because she needs it. Well, and we have a way of, of doing this in our clinic. Can I share with you how we do it? Oh yeah, sure. Because you could share it with her if you like. Um, everybody who comes in to see us is a little nervous because they imagine, oh my goodness sakes, if you're gonna make me into a vegan, I'm gonna probably have to acquire a taste for folk music now. Um, I'm gonna have to wear tie-dyed clothes. You know, <laughs> it, uh, I'm, all the joys of life are gonna be gone. They, they have all these crazy fears. Anyway, but here's what you do. You say, okay, let's, the, step one is one week, step two is three weeks. Mm -hmm. Step one, for the next week, eat whatever you want. You don't have to take anything out of your diet at all. But what we are gonna do is we're gonna take a piece of paper, like this one, and um, write breakfast, lunch, dinner, snack on it. And say for the next seven days, think about foods that don't have animal products in it that you might actually like, and write them down. So she says, okay, well, I have cornflakes, but I have it with milk. I guess that's not vegan, is it? Mm -mm, it isn't, but how do I veganize it? Ah, at the store, I saw almond milk. I'll try that. Have you ever tasted it? No. Well, you got seven days, taste it, see if you like it. Um, and, and by the way, right next to it, they have rice milk, oat milk, cashew milk. I mean, you name it, they got everything. Um, so try a couple of them, and, and if you like them, write them down. Um, every day I have lunch at Subway. Um, do they have a vegan sub? Yeah, they do. I never tried it. Okay, try it. If you like it, write it down. Um, let's see, at, at my, my dinner, I always have pizza. Could I make a pizza without cheese? Maybe. Uh, nutritional yeast. My friend was telling me to sprinkle nutritional yeast into the sauce and it gives it a cheesy flavor, but I never tried it. Go to this health food store and pick it up. You got seven days. Okay, so for seven days, I'm filling out my list. I'm gonna have breakfast, lunches, and dinners. And, and some you have already. You already know how to make oatmeal or grits or cream of wheat or whatever. And you leave the butter out, you're fine. So, okay, seven days go by. You got a great list. Now, step two is three weeks. During these three weeks, I'm gonna go all vegan all the time. But that is easy because, well, frankly, I can do anything for three weeks. And secondly, I've already got my list. I already figured out which foods work for me. And in fact, I bought them. So I got oatmeal, I got almond milk, I got some veggie sausage I tried that's actually kind of good. Um, I discovered Taco Bell, who, who knew? They've got a vegan burrito. All right, great, I can do this for three weeks. At the end of three weeks, two things happen. Number one, you're physically healthier. You lost a couple of pounds. Your digestion is better. If you have diabetes, your blood sugar is starting to inch down for some reason. But the second thing is your tastes are now shifting where there are certain things you thought you couldn't live without that you don't care anymore, actually. And then there's some new tastes and you've discovered new websites and new recipes and new books and, and even some movies and several friends who've been doing this too. And it's just cool. So you think, all right, you can add another week, keep going as, as long as you want to. Um, and that's what we see. And for so many people, it's kind of like quitting smoking. Your two minds, do I really want to do this? Do I not want to do it? The more momentum you get, the better off you're going to be. But you also know that if you cheat once, not so good. It kind of throws you back. You got to dust yourself off, forgive yourself, get back on the wagon. And um, it, it, is, it is the coolest thing for people to do. Yeah, that's definitely me with cheese, the setting myself back by getting... Um, shredded cheese on my bowl at Chipotle or something like that. Like that's definitely a huge setback, but I'm definitely going to be working on it now. Definitely. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So um, yeah. Um, oh, in people you talk to are ethics part of it or is it mostly health? Um, I would say it's definitely mostly health, but when I was doing the vegan pledge, ethics were definitely a part of it as well. Mm -hmm. um, the, reason, the reason that I ask about that is when I see patients here, they have all kinds of motivations and I'd like to, to um, work with them on that. Uh, and, and there are so many people who will say, well, I went vegan for the animals or, or I went vegetarian for the animals, but they'll say, well, but, but I'm, not, I'm having dairy and I'm having eggs because they don't kill the cows or the chickens. And there's one fact that that's sometimes is good to share with people. Um, and if you don't mind, I'll share it with you just to pass along to other people. Um, Cows are killed for beef, obviously. But when you make uh, milk, when a cow makes milk, you don't kill a cow, right? 
Well, here's what they do to a cow. And just very quickly, um, the cow has to be pregnant in order to make milk. Cows don't make any milk. Mammals don't make milk until they're pregnant and have given birth. Um, and the way she gets pregnant is really kind of creepy. It's not done with, you know, soft music and roses and chocolates. You know, this is not a romantic scene on the hillside. Um, she will have a farmhand on her backside um, doing some things that nobody really wants to have done. And she is not going to be able to fight it because she is chained by the neck and she's impregnated against her will. Um, then nine months later, she's going to give birth. And there's nothing cuter than a newborn calf, I got to tell you. They are all awkward and they're stumbling around and, and the mother's like looking at her baby trying to get the baby to stand up and, and so forth but then the farm hands all come around and they go this is so beautiful to see she's got this baby but then they say this is a dairy and if the baby drinks the milk we don't have anything to sell so they come by with a wheelbarrow and they pick up the baby and they put the baby in the wheelbarrow and the baby takes a look at mom and mom says wait a minute and there is no bond in nature stronger than that between a mother and her baby. And she will follow and do her best to, to say, I want my baby. And a gate will slam in her face and she will stand right there and she will cry out. Now she's only a cow and she doesn't really matter very much maybe. And maybe her calf doesn't matter too much either. The calf is gonna be put in an isolation uh, hutch and will cry out all night long for mom. And every glass of milk you ever had came from this. And then if the baby is a male, the male will be killed very soon because people think veal is a lovely thing. And veal is just the rubbery muscles of a newly slaughtered male calf. If she's female, they're going to keep her alive long enough to impregnate her. So when she's a year or so old, some farmhand is going to take her backside and do some things she didn't ask for. And she's going to get pregnant and her baby will be taken away. And this is going to happen for each cow about four times, five times. And a cow normally lives to be 20, but farmers are being are good business people. And so they measure how much milk she's making. And by the time she's four, she's not keeping up so much. So they're gonna put her in a truck and at the other end, someone's gonna hoist her up by her rear legs and they're gonna slit her throat and the blood's gonna go all over the floor. And some McDonald's somewhere is gonna have really cheap hamburger that used to be this cow. And her daughter and all of them are gonna end up in that way. So. Um, the dairy industry is a meat industry. They're all dead, they're all killed. Um, but they are impregnated and their in infants are taken away um, every year until they're killed. So the reason I mention this is I'm a doctor, but I find that all my patients are thinking people and they have certain values that when they open their eyes a little bit, they start thinking, well, maybe it's not just me that I'm eating for. And maybe if I change this, it's good for the cow. And then the last thing is that their environmental friends all say, well, it's a good thing you're not eating them anymore because they're belching methane into the atmosphere. And we got millions and millions and millions of cows. And whether they're making, whether they're making cheddar cheese or, or meat, every single one of them is bel belching methane, which is the most powerful greenhouse chemical we got. Um, so when we have beans and rice and broccoli, nobody had to get pregnant. Nobody had to get hauled off to slaughter, and all of our environmentalist friends are smiling at us. Yeah, well, thank you for that information. It's definitely helpful, and it's definitely something to think about, for sure. Whether you're a meat eater, vegetarian, or vegan, it's definitely something to think about. And everybody's in a process of transition. We're, we're all learning new things, and I certainly am, too. Yeah, yeah, me too. <laughs> so finally, Dr. Bernard, Please tell us more about the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine and how it directly affects the quality of patient care in the United States. Um, probably the thing that people think of us most for is we make educational materials. We make the 21 Day Vegan Kickstart, which is an app on your iPhone or on your Android, and thousands and thousands and thousands of people have used it. It's in English, it's in Spanish, and we we originally made it for our doctors to use with patients, but now patients just get it anyway because it's got menus, recipes, cooking videos, and it walks you step by step what to do. And we uh, have many, many educational programs like that, including immersions uh, of all kinds. And you'll see lots more information and lots more cool recipes at pcrm.org. Cool. Thank you. I'll definitely be checking that out for myself too. Great. Did you have anything else you wanted to add before we conclude the interview? Um, just one thing, and, and that's a big thank you. 
um, you're taking really important information and you're sharing it with other people. And you'll never know how many people you reach and how many people you educate and how many people you intrigue um, enough to, for them to share this with other people. But I guarantee you it's a lot. And they in turn share it with others and others and others. So you're never gonna know how many lives you change, how many lives you save, but it's a lot. And a doctor in a given day, you know, we might see 20 people, 25 people. You reach a whole lot more people than that. And I thank you for that. Of course, you're welcome. And we appreciate all of the information that you gave us today in this interview. It was great. I'm definitely going to take away a lot. And I know that our viewers will as well. So thank you so much for taking the time out to interview with us. It's been fun talking with you today.